If you do like these tank chats, do please subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel. This tank chat is going to be about the British Army's Challenger 2 tank. And we have the great advantage with Challenger 2, it's an in-service vehicle. Because we've got so much material on Challenger 2, we're going to break this tank chat into two parts. The first part, I'm going to be telling you about the design and what was behind Challenger 2. And in the second part, we're going to talk to some of the soldiers that serve on Challenger 2, look at some of the details of the tank, and also a little bit about where it saw service. We've already talked about the Challenger 1 tank in an earlier tank chat, and I'd recommend have a look at that because that gives the background uh, to why MBT-80 was cancelled and some of the issues that go around that do affect what's going to become Challenger 2. Now, looking at Challenger 2, again, as with Challenger 1, it can seem a fairly complex story, so bear with me again. There's a number of different streams of activities that we need to look at, um, some of which were going on at the same time, so they sort of overlap and everything. So I'll just try and take you through those, but the key one to start with is what is the threat? Why are Challenger 2 tanks being built? Um, now this again, so let's go back, we're looking at the Cold War, we're looking at the NATO countries, the Western Allies, uh, the threat of, as they believe it at the time, an invasion from the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact countries coming from the East. Now at the 1960s, 70s, 80s, We've been tracking Soviet tank development all the time in NATO and one of the issues that despite the fact that the frontline soldiers often think their kit's best, that it's better than any enemies that's uh, going to fight against them, in the background the intelligence services of the military and certainly in Britain, uh, we had a worry that the Soviet vehicles coming into service and the Soviets are putting a new tank into service, it works out on average about every seven years, some of these vehicles are catching up with or if not overtaking those vehicles that are in service in the West and we like to have a think in the NATO countries that we always had a technological superiority there. Now this was vitally important for the British forces because what you're looking at is where the British two armoured divisions were going to fight in what was then West Germany if the Soviets had attacked, they estimated there would be about 2,000 Soviet tanks uh, fighting against the, British, the two British divisions. And if those British tanks survived what was bound to be a massive Soviet artillery barrage before the attack began, it was estimated in some sectors the British tanks, like the Chieftain, were going to have to take on what might have been 5 to 1 or even 10 to 1 odds against the Soviets. And again, in terms of the technology, worryingly for Britain, uh, when the T-64 tank went into service in 1976, what ends up happening is that they do an estimate that in 1978, they reckon that a chieftain can knock out a T-64 tank at about 2,500 metres. It can pierce the frontal armour of that Soviet tank. However, they then worked out that the Soviet T-64, with its new 125mm gun, could penetrate the front armour of the chieftain tank at about 2,700 metres. So that's what, in the military terms, they say overmatch. In other words, that tank has a certain superiority there in that particular um, area of firepower. Now, as we all know, and we've said it here before, it's not just top trumps with tanks, it's not just technological features, it can be the training, it can be the deployment, it can be the tactics news, and again, in the West, in NATO countries, we like to comfort ourselves that we were going to be going into pre-prepared positions, uh, we had killing zones where we thought we'd be taking on the Soviet attack, etc., etc. So it's not just an equal balance uh, in just doing it in stats and figures. But that nature of the Soviet threat was starting to worry, or certainly worried the West. And not only were we looking at the tanks that were in service uh, in NATO countries, they called it FSR, um, Future Soviet uh, Requirement, or Future Soviet Tank, FST. They're looking at this idea, what's coming next? So it could be FSR1, FSR2, 
Um, these ones that are coming down the pipeline, so when we're thinking about our own tanks, not only do we need lethality or firepower that can take on that tank and protection that can protect our own tanks for the current in-service generation that you might be fighting, you've got to look ahead to the future. And that nicely segues on to MBT-80. We've talked about MBT-80. It was a program in Britain, 77 to about 1980 when it was cancelled, where we were looking at what would be the ideal way of countering that Soviet threat with a main battle tank. And technologies were researched at the time when the project was cancelled because it was going on a long time. Uh, MBT-80, at one point they were saying MBT meetings before tanks, you know, it was jokingly sort of said this idea it might go on forever. There was technology that weren't mature and the need to get a tank into service to bolster the Chieftain fleet led to that uh, cancellation of the MBT-80 project and Challenger 1 going into service. But as I mentioned in the earlier Challenger 1 uh, tank chat, some of those technologies that were being looked at for MBT-80 were very advanced and very clever. So they'd done things like they'd been looking at things like mobility, you know, was a gas turbine an option? Uh, and they put a gas turbine against a CV-12 diesel engine. Um, the key area, though, is relating to what we just talked about, about the Soviet threat, was about firepower and gunnery. Because as we know, really, uh, with Challenger 1, um, when that went into service, it had pretty much the same firepower levels as the earlier Chieftain. And we knew, we were already thinking, Chieftain's not going to be good enough for some of these Soviet tanks coming into service. So what are we doing next? And one of the key things, again for Britain, thinking where it might be fighting on the North German plane with that plethora of targets coming at it, is let's look at the gunnery and the sighting systems because that's going to be most important for us. And for MBT-80, they explored what we now know as the hunter-killer system. Not particularly new, um, because you had the idea of the commander as a hunter, actually even on Conqueror and Chieftain when he's got his uh, separate cupola, he can be looking out for other targets. That was already a, an earlier concept. But with the development of MBT-80, what they looked at was the idea, instead of slaving the site to the main armament, why not slave the main armament to the site? So what does that mean? So instead of having, as you normally have in a tank turret, the site going parallel down the side, uh, coaxially to the main armament, so as you turn the gun around, you're sighting it, why not do it the other way around, where actually you can sight on target, then the gun goes to where the target is. The advantage of that, of course, is that the gunner can be doing his business whilst the commander is picking up targets. And what they came up with was an idea that the commander as the hunter has his own sight and what he actually does is he looks at the terrain, he sights on an enemy, he dots, as it were, on the computer that sight, the gun then turns to that uh, fires, the computer's already working out the distance, etc., that that entails. So the commander's moving on and he can actually dot a number of targets and uh, actually override and prioritise targets, etc. Now, that is obviously a fairly complex system that they were looking at uh, way back at the end of the 70s, early 80s uh, for potentially MBT-80. Now, they actually even included some of the avionics guys that were working on what becomes a tornado jet fighter um, for their fire systems, etc., and they're using to develop this some of the very first micro uh, processors. So this was very technologically advanced, but the whole point was it was trying to halve the engagement time from Chieftain. Um, so let's make this much quicker so we can take on targets that much quicker. So remember that one because that's one of those bits of technology that is really useful um, from MBT-80. Now, another issue that's going on as well in the background is Vickers Defence System. Um, we all know the name Vickers. Back in the 30s and late 20s, it's exporting tanks. It's got a history of making export model vehicles. And Vickers, again, after the Second World War, um, they come up with the 37 tonne, it's like a Mark I Vickers export tank, but it's almost like a lighter version of the Centurion. They realise there's always going to be a market out there for people that want to buy a tank but they don't necessarily need the top end product all the time. They need a tank but they don't necessarily have to have the cutting technology or the full weight specification of a Cold War vehicle. 
So the Mark I Vickers tank was exported, it went to Kuwait, it went to India. Uh, they carried on that program. They came up with a later model that was sold um, out into Africa. So uh, Kenya, Nigeria were buying Vickers export tanks. And in the mid 1980s, after Challenger 1's gone into service, using some of the technology that had been developed for the MBT-80 program, Vickers come up with what they call the Mark 7 uh, export tank that was available for sale. And that tank used some of this new gunnery uh, in its turret. It looked at as well other types of uh, stealth features almost, like how do you actually stop yourself being uh, targeted by the enemy in the first place. So they start uh, designing the turret so it pings back radar. It's got issues so that you're not, you don't appear so much so easily on the electromagnetic spectrum. So this type of thing was all put into this new turret. And that tank, this export tank, ends up going down to Lulworth, down the road from here, the gunnery ranges, and they do a firing competition with the Mark 7 Vickers export tank against a Challenger 1 tank. And this tank about halves the engagement time and completely creams, completely beats Challenger 1's in terms of the gunnery trial. This was obviously something that the British Army was going to have to take notice of as well. So Vickers are in that export game, but they've also been developing this new tank turret using, having the benefit of using some of the technologies that weren't necessarily ready in time or couldn't be put onto Challenger 1. So there's that element as well to think about there. And of course, Britain has put Challenger 1 into service. Now, Challenger 1, when it goes into service, it only takes up about, it's just over about 400 of about 1,000 tank fleet that was around at the time. The rest of them are still chieftains. And again, when we look at that Challenger 1 story, uh, it goes into service, but it's not a full answer to the problems. The specifications for MBT-80, what the British Army really wanted, has not necessarily been met fully. And there's another element there, which in the background, there's almost this attitude that at some point in the future we are and they were probably estimating mid to late 90s we're going to need another tank to go into service that whether it's going to be bought from abroad or whether it's going to incorporate all these MBT-80 new types of technology we're going to need something there so this leads in 1986 uh, what's called the Master General Ordnance, uh, Sir Dick Vincent, he goes off to Vickers Defence System and he sits with them and he has a chat and he says, look, we're going to have to require a new tank in the future. And I'm just going to read you my notes which actually list what that tank was going to be needed to do and the priorities that the British Army were going to put because as we all know, a tank is always a compromise. If you have got great firepower, if you have thick armor, tends to make the tank slower, um, mobility, all those different elements. What is it that Britain considered the primary uh, role of that tank? How's it going to work? So let me just read to you what Dick Vincent is ending up saying um, to Vickers and the priorities that come out of this that sets the Challenger 2 program in essence going with Vickers. So this is what the British Army decides it wants, and it's actually called a, a Staff Target Land, or STL, 4004. This is what they say. They want it to have new firepower to defeat at 2,000 metres the frontal armour of any Soviet tank and helicopters out to 3,000 metres. Again, back then, the new threat seems to be helicopters. How are we going to take those down as well? It's got to improve the survivability over Challenger 1. It's got to have mobility as good as Leopard 2. It's got to have availability. In other words, this thing can't be broken down all the time. Availability as good as Challenger 1, which had increased considerably um, since way back in the days of Chieftain. And uh, it's got to have interoperability, hopefully with the same fuel, same ammunition as other NATO countries. And we'll see that changes slightly. And the British Army says it orders these issues that go with a tank into this order. Firepower is prominent, is, is absolute paramount, I should say. Survivability, second. Mobility, third. Reliability, fourth. Interoperability, fifth. Fightability, next. Simplicity, again, that was another really important thing there, and command and control features last on that list there. So that was how Britain looked at that as one of those issues when it's going to Vickers.
So what happens? Vickers goes away. It's often, if you read the different accounts of Chapter 2, it says it's a private venture. Not really, because they know that the army is setting out this requirement. They know that behind the scenes that there is a requirement for a tank that is going to meet the army's uh, needs other than Challenger 1. And as we said, that the army really wants about uh, 800 to 1,000 tanks in service. Challenger 1 is only making up about 400 of those tanks, just slightly over that. Um, so there, there is a, a, a need out there. It's not just a pure private venture on behalf of Vickers. They come back the following year to MOD with a couple of options, one of which is a slightly souped up Challenger 1. Another one is an option that gives the MOD basically an improved Challenger 1 hull, but the real key, it's almost got that turret off the Mark 7 export tank. Um, it's going to cost you about £65,000 more, but it's got that superior firepower that there it was at the top of the list from the MOD. Um, MOD goes away, it looks at other industries, it sort of says, uh, he goes to Chertsey again and says, what might you come up with? Um, they come up with something called PIP, Pro Product Improved um, Tank. So there's a number of options that go on at the same time. It is not a done deal with Vickers, but Vickers ends up getting a contract to develop the Challenger 2 idea, where lots of other things are being um, looked at at the same time, and we'll talk about some of those in a second. Um, so this idea that um, it's about 10% changes, MOD says to Vickers, we need it to do this, not that, etc. as they go away, and Vickers goes away and starts working on this. And two key points come out here, one of which is with the Challenger 2, MOD are absolutely determined that with that reliability, this is going to be a tank that is heavily tested before it gets out to the troops. Um, so we know about reliability, all those different issues have really been dealt with. So in the end, they actually talk about Challenger 2 as probably the most tested tank in history. Lots and lots of evaluation goes on, lots of testing. There's also a point as well where it becomes very much a co a uh, cooperative venture between MOD and Vickers because both sides want to get the best thing. And that's always nice to hear um, because from the point of view of actually the end user troop wants the best thing, not just um, what they could have afforded, etc. at the time. But I mentioned the word afforded because there's another key element there, cost. And this is one of those things that quite often when we talk about technologies, etc., we rarely bring in the idea of cost. Um, the British government are obviously do not want to pay too much money um, for whatever tank is going into service next. Next, so that this idea of a fixed price contract is really important for MOD with Vickers. What can we get for that money? And we can't see it creeping up all over the place, um, but we need it to be a reliable vehicle. And there's some of the items that might have been nice to see on Challenger 2 in the end just don't get there because of cost issues. Uh, and that money also, this affects when at a point in the program, uh, the British government says to MOD, right, let's lay out the options. Nine different options are being looked at, including Leopard 2. Leopard 2 was assessed heavily. Um, the British Army likes Leopard 2, but it does not think that the levels of protection on the turret are good enough. When they say about, could we put Chobham armor on it? That ended up, we like the idea as well, you know, what about if we change the smoothbore gun, etc., to a rifle gun? Um, what happens there is that they decide that, no, that's going to take too long. It's going to cost too much money. It'll be another at least a couple of years. We're going to drop that one. And the Leopard 2 package, they like Abrams as well. That's offered as well. But both the Abrams and the Leopard 2 comes in at over 2.5 billion to pay for a new fleet of tanks and all the ancillaries that go with that. Challenger 2 is being offered at 1.75 billion. So that is one of those other key deciders. And of course, in the background, you've got that issue that uh, Margaret Thatcher at the time and then John Major, they're very keen really to see MOD buy British as well. They want to see that investment going into Vickers as a British company. Vickers end up buying the Royal Ordnance Factory at Leeds. They've got the new factory up in Newcastle. You know, there's a lot, there's a point in 1989 where Vickers are saying, listen, unless we get some orders soon, we're really looking at uh, 1.5 million a month, as it were, just to keep these factories going and open um, with nothing there. So we really need to, if, you, if you're going to use us, otherwise, again, and this is one of those long-term strategic problems governments have, um, do you want your own defence industry? Um, absolutely, if you can't afford to keep one going, etc., or it's too small, uh, it seems logical, buy abroad, but what when abroad is not available to sell to you, or all of a sudden in times of war they might want material for their own 
armed forces and not want to sell to you. So, um, you know, a whole host of other issues coming into play here, politics as well as budgets there. Now, I mentioned earlier as well, MBT 80, what was going on with some of that research. Gunnery, we've said about the sighting, but also the Royal Armaments Research and Development Establishment is looking at a new 120 millimeter rifle gun. Now, when they said earlier they wanted interoperability with other nations, why didn't we go for smoothbore? Now, Britain has what some people have almost called an obsession with a Hesh round, and Hesh has to be fired by a rifled gun to get its best effect. So what is it about Hesh? Britain liked Hesh because the primary purpose of a 120 gun is firing uh, an armour-piercing round, and as we know, a fin round, the longer the fin round, uh, the more force behind it, the more armour it's going to go through. So that was the primary round. But secondary, for the role of high explosive and potential bunker busting, knocking out other armour, etc., um, a Hesh round, high explosive squash head, works very, very well as well. Uh, and Britain liked this. The whole idea of a Hesh round, a thin outer coating, an inert uh, sort of material on the top of it, the rest of the shell full of high explosive, a detonator at the base. And the idea is, is it doesn't matter about the force behind the round. Uh, when it hits its target, it tends to, if it's armour or building, it will pancake, it will squash against that target before the detonator hits as well and detonates that pancake of high explosive. That sends a shock wave of its armour plate through and a scab comes off on the inside. Now that means you can fire this round at an enormous distance because the force is not the issue. As long as it hits the target, the effect will be the same. And uh, we like that. And in the end, actually, that, that Hesh round, very useful. Um, we were even using practice Hesh rounds that are actually full of concrete in Operation Telic in Iraq um, because they were actually firing um, these practice rounds to do what they call mouse holding. It would end up burrowing its way through things like concrete or adobe walls, giving a hole for the soldiers to follow through um, without collateral damage. So again, very interesting use there of uh, of a training Hesh round. So Britain still like that idea of Hesh. So again, that gun married up with that Mark VII turret is going to give Challenger that fighting edge. Now, in May of 1994, Challenger 2, after various different types of trials, is accepted into service. Those trials continue. As I mentioned, it's tested, it's trialed all the time. Um, by the summer of uh, 1994, it's driven about 22,000 kilometers. Um, there's nine prototypes. Uh, so Robert Heyman Joyce, who's put in charge of the project at one point, he gets some extra money out the treasury. Let's build nine prototypes so we can really trial all the different features of Challenger, um, really to get the best from it. Uh, reliability improvement programs, they're called as they're going on. What can we make this better? How can we make it more efficient? Um, they end up with those nine prototypes. Two are made in Newcastle, the rest of them made down at the Leeds factory. And this one standing next to me is actually V5. They're V1 to V9, um, V for Vickers, we're not sure vehicle. Um, and this one, V5, was mainly used for automotive trials. So it's driven around the place. So 22,000 kilometers driven by those Challenger uh, prototype vehicles. 12,000 rounds fired by the main armament. You know, this is really a heavily tested tank before it's accepted. It goes into production. Those first vehicles that come out have problems, um, and that's another little lesson to learn. So the uh, prototype vehicles compared to the production vehicles aren't always the same. So that led the army to do, introduce sort of field trials teams and integration teams so that it worked out that I think it's about four in every 38 Challenger 2s that came off the production line ended up being taken to one side and examined heavily and it was also helped as well that the field army could help integrate when they're actually being issued so that they could be warned of or look at some of those issues so there's those problems any other problems when you've got a big complex system they're bound to be there um, can be ironed out quickly and that is fed back to the production run.
Now, this all takes place over from the later 1980s, Cold War still going on. Uh, obviously, the Berlin Wall comes down in 1990. There was an initial estimate, 800 plus Challenger 2s might be needed. As soon as the ball at Berlin Wall comes down, it comes down to about 360 plus um, Challenger 2s uh, are actually put on order. And in 1990, with the Gulf War, another thing that comes into play as well is that all production, all all development is stopped at that particular time, so concentrations can go on to the Challenger 1 fleet going out to fight uh, in the Gulf War. So that, that was another one of those areas where, again, actually in the background, Vickers kept on the development and the testing programme at their own expense because they're very keen to make sure this is a good product there. So it's given out to the field army. Um, it's a tank that, as I say, has had tremendous amounts of research going on behind it. Um, it's got, it takes with it the hull in essence, um, slightly improved from the Challenger 1. It's got an improved level of Dorchester armour on it that's going to be put on that. It's got this fantastic hunter killer system in terms of the gunnery. It's got a CV-12 uh, diesel engine in the back of it um, and it is quite an impressive package. And again, when it's issued to the troops, there is this sort of sense of when they're looking at it, they're looking at the pros and cons. This is a real step change from Challenger 1 and Chieftain that's been in service. So that's that bit of the development story. Let's just have a look now at some of the features by looking at our Challenger 2 here. If you're interested to know more about Challenger 2, we've helped in this uh, Haynes manual on the Challenger 2. You can get this via uh, our shop. So look at our online website, which sells all sorts of other products as well. And do please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you have the opportunity, um, also back us by funding us through Patreon. Um, we are an independent charity. We can only carry on doing all this if people like yourself support us. So please do find a way of supporting the Tank Museum.